a hush falls over the room. Oops, the water spills. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to what promises to be an energizing and illuminating Ask With Forum about leadership for student success in higher education. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Associate Dean for Learning and Teaching and a Senior Lecturer here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. Um, and I'll be the moderator for this afternoon's discussion. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, the Ask With Forums are HGSE's signature public lecture series. The forums highlight leaders, share new knowledge, and offer insight into the highest priority challenges facing education. Through collegial conversation and the respectful exchange of ideas, uh, the forums reflect the rich diversity of perspectives in our field. We're delighted that you've joined us here today, both here in person and uh, via live stream, and we hope you'll join us for future Ask With Forums as well. And now, to the important topic at hand. According to recent attitude surveys, American higher education is in trouble in the eyes of the public. Only 48% of respondents in a recent Gallup poll have quite a lot or a great deal of confidence in higher education. In fact, that number represents the largest drop of any societal institution measured by Gallup over the last three-year period. Um, and while the drop was bigger for political conservatives than others, the decline was true across the board, across political affiliations. Now, a very recent Pew study provides similar findings and some clues about these attitudes. Across our political divides, we can all agree on a few things, apparently. Higher education is headed in the wrong direction. And the top two reasons cited are these. The cost of tuition and the perception that students are not getting the skills they need to succeed in the workplace and the economy. This afternoon's topic of discussion, the intentional focus on student success in higher education, offers some hope, though, I think, in rebuilding the public trust. But first, let's get a little grounding in the terms we're using. Um, in using the term student success, we build upon a notion that combines attention to student access, experiences within our institutions, and outcomes, especially for students historically marginalized by and within our higher education system. Students of color, first generation students, and those from low income backgrounds, and the intersections of those groups. As researchers, as researchers Jillian Kinsey and George Koo put it, student success includes, but is more than just, degree attainment. It's about increased numbers of diverse student groups participating in what they call high quality educational experiences and earning high quality credentials, such as degrees, certifications, and certificates. Or as one community college president put it to me, it's about enabling students to pursue their own dreams and realize them. But let's focus on the dimension of completion for a moment. There are, by government estimates, 16.9 million undergraduate students this fall in the United States across various types of institutions. And it's hard to ignore the graduation rates that they may experience. Across the entire post-secondary system, can we show the slide, please? Across the entire post-secondary system, um, according to the most recent data, only 58% of students who attempt a degree will complete it in six years. So put another way, four in 10 students may be left paying for some or a lot of expenses without having a meaningful credential to show for it. And surely we can do better uh, by our students. And in disaggregating the national data, completion rates for black and Latinx students in particular are below those of their white and Asian counterparts. These are equity gaps 
at the systemic level, gaps not related to individual students themselves, their potential, their ability, but rather to the intertwined structuring of opportunity, advantage, and privilege that pervades our society and its institutions. So, if institutions are going to be serious about student success, then a rising tide lifts all um, is not going to be enough. And we also need an intentional focus on equity and on the gaps our institutions perpetuate rather than close. As the American Association of Colleges and Universities put it, higher education leaders must be equity-minded in our practice. As they put it, equity-minded leaders are aware of the historical context of exclusionary practices in higher education, and they recognize the impact of this history. They recognize the contradiction between the ideals of democratic education on the one hand and the social, institutional, and individual practices that contribute to persistent inequities in college outcomes. Equity-minded leaders also reject the ingrained habit of blaming inequities in access, opportunity, and outcomes on students' own cultural, social, and educational backgrounds. So when we use the term equitable student success, as we began to do uh, on our project, we mean to signal that the student success work and equity work in colleges and universities are inextricably bound up together. In tonight's forum, you'll be hearing from a leader in institutional transformation at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and from uh, two of my colleagues. Uh, together, the three of us from HGSC undertook a multi-part research and advisory project with the Gates Foundation to explore capacity building for student success. What does that mean? Well, how do institutions switch their framing from putting the burden of change on college-ready students alone and instead see their work as about becoming truly a student-ready college? Um, let's quickly summarize a framework for this institutional transformation process that may help us out in our, uh, in our conversation. And this builds on concepts from the long work of the Gates Foundation in rallying, convening, supporting, studying uh, the work of hundreds of partner organizations, I'm sure by now, and so many colleges and universities operating in a variety of networks over decades. And the foundation describes three ingredients in student success efforts in institutional transformation. And I just want to talk about them very quickly. The first is capacities, and that was the focus of uh, the project you'll be hearing about um, from Jim Honan and Bridget Long. This is an institution's collective ability um, in key areas for institutional transformation. And these include things like leadership, using data in institutional research, strategic finance, information technology, uh, policy levers. Um, the second concept is solutions, and this is what you may read a lot about if you follow changes in higher education. It's often not about capacity development, it's about specific solutions. So these are things like reforming developmental education or remedial education pathways, using digital learning in new and effective ways, adopting high impact advising practices, um, and making emergency aid and support more accessible for students. And uh, the third feature uh, is pathways. And this sort of refers to the, the work that's been done on creating simplified uh, at ways of students pursuing their degrees, clarifying and simplifying their choices. You may have heard of this as guided pathways from Teachers College, the Community College Research Center's important work there. Um, but the idea of pathways is making it possible to support students as they choose, pursue, and complete a specific program or credentialing process as being something fundamental. Um, and the work that our most recent project has done focused on building capacities, especially in leadership, strategic finance, and use of data. So we'll be talking about those in some depth. Um, we were asking, what's out there to help institutions in getting better, right? And then also, 
Um, what are the possibilities? How do institutions improve the way they improve? How do they get better at the ways they need to operate with those capacities that enable um, student success? So in our discussion, our panelists will share some of the ideas from this work, but I suspect we're going to range more widely, thinking generally about research and practice, and hopefully findings related to equitable uh, student success generally. Um, and so now I'm going to invite each of our panelists to introduce themselves briefly and provide a more specific introduction to the work that they're doing um, connected to the larger student success movement. Um, Archie Kubarubia, Bridget Long, and Jim Honan are our panelists. Um, after we hear from each of them, we'll have uh, a group discussion, and then we'll engage with questions from, uh, from this entire uh, group. So, Archie, let's start with you. Yeah, and good afternoon. My name is Archie Kubarubi. I serve as Deputy Director for Institutional Transformation at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Now, full disclosure, I've only been in this role for about three months. <laughs> so I may not have all the answers, but I am fairly familiar with the work of the foundation in the field. Uh, prior to this, I served as the Vice Provost for Institutional Effectiveness at Miami-Dade College in Miami, Florida. And then prior to that, I spent almost a decade at the U.S. Department of Education working on the very fun topics of, of higher education accountability under both the Bush and Obama administrations. So I am one of those higher ed lifers, as I like to call myself, um, and I'm really, really honored to be here with you today. I'm very excited to share a little bit about uh, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation's work on post-secondary student success with you. At the foundation, we believe that every person deserves a chance to live a healthy, productive life. In the U.S., that means access to life-changing opportunities like education, which we know is the key not just to economic mobility, but more importantly to social mobility. But as we know as well, too few of today's students, and that's our low-income, uh, first-generation students, students of color, working adults, too few of them have clear pathways to a post-secondary credential. And so, uh, as Matt mentioned, we support at the foundation, we support innovative evidence-based solutions that are designed to help students get on a pathway, stay on the pathway, complete that pathway, and hopefully learn along the way. But we know that barriers that contribute to opportunity gaps in post-secondary education still exist. And note, I do not use the word achievement, I do not use the term achievement gap, but rather opportunity gaps, because I think that's what we're really talking about here to try to address. Some of these barriers are longstanding and systemic, and certainly the foundation is very interested in helping address some of that. But candidly, and I say this as a higher ed education administrator, I didn't tell you that before I joined the department, I was also a higher ed administrator, um, that candidly, we as a field have set up barriers, artificial barriers, for student success. Some of them may be by choice. Some of them may be as a result of consequences, um, like uh, as a result of unintended consequences from policy developments. In our work, we found that many of our students are now becoming college ready. And as Matt mentioned, what we're finding now is that many of our colleges and universities are in fact not student ready. I feel indicted by this uh, as a higher education administrator, because if you think about it, when was the last time we as a field systematically interrogated our business processes, both our front end business processes and back of the house processes, to think about what artificial barriers have we set up for our students? Things like, hey, do you have to fill out this form and that form and this form and that form and go to this building and that building? Think about the barriers that we're setting up for students who may be the first in their family to attend and who may not have the social capital to navigate the, the very Byzantine systems that we've set up for them. But we do know that there are student-ready colleges, and so at the foundation we've invested in learning more about these institutions that have placed student success front and center. First, how they did it. Second, how they're sustaining the work. And third, and more important, how more institutions can follow in their footsteps to prioritize student success. And so in 2011, we started with nine leading community colleges with an initiative called Completion by Design. Miami-Dade College was a, a Completion by Design institution. And then in 2015, we launched the, Frontiers, the Frontier Set, which is a network of 29 high-performing or high, um, high potential colleges or universities and two state systems that were committed to dramatically increasing student success 
reducing equity gaps, and then transforming the way they do their business. Here's what we found so far. Institutions that are engaged in deep and sustainable transformation live out a student-centered mission that shows up in things like their priorities, their structure, and their resource allocation decisions. So they set aggressive goals and hold themselves accountable to them. They use data intentionally to make decisions. They spend their money on things that actually matter. They create collaborative environments that break down silos, and they commit themselves to warts and all continuous improvement. Think about that, and think about the kinds of capacities that you would need to do all of those things. So what we're learning is that a key element to these kinds of institutional behaviors is leadership that's centered around student success. I came into this field thinking, oh yes, everybody in higher education is about student success, right? <laughs> right? We're here because we want students to succeed. I think that's an assumption that's actually worth thinking through. So we're continuing to learn on that journey of institutional transformation, but at the same time, we also want to help the field cultivate the ecosystem so we can do this work at scale. And so we're helping to support networks of institutions and intermediaries to help more colleges and universities on their transformation journeys. And we're helping enable environments uh, like policy environments so that these transformation journeys can occur. Let me close by saying, I am a self-professed higher education history buff. Like I said, this is all I know. So if I, I can't find another field because I'm a higher ed person. Um, I'm excited about this work because if you are a higher ed history nerd yourself, you know that we are again at an inflection point in the field, right? So thankfully for organizations and uh, programs like the Institute for Educational Management, we have more college leaders who are waking up and are training themselves around the importance of student success. And so I believe that we have an opportunity to change the trajectory of the field and more importantly, to change the lives of our students and their families for the next 50 years. Thank you. Thanks, Archie. Bridget. Thank you. Uh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Uh, my name is Bridget Terry Long, and I'm very proud to be the dean here at the Graduate School of Education. Um, but for nearly 20 years, I've also been a member of the higher education faculty, um, and I want to uh, recognize the 50th anniversary of IEM, and for many who are here celebrating as part of that, but also all of our higher education uh, students. That's absolutely wonderful. Yes. So, uh, as a, you know, I've come into this dean role already, though, having long been committed to higher education. Um, this is an amazing field, and it is an urgent time. What we do as professionals, what we do to support students, um, makes a major difference and is going to determine so much about what happens in this country and other countries in terms of inequality and poverty um, and families and communities. Uh, we are second chance institutions. We are, we take in the brightest and do innovation and discovery. We support the communities around us, but it takes nimble, passionate, informed, evidence-based leadership. Uh, and so I think that's why it's so important having these conversations now. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of, of my work um, and my part on, on the project that Matt uh, talked a little bit about. Um, and my training is as an economist, and I've spent a, lo a, a lot of time um, nailing down what are some of the challenges that students are facing and what are some of the things we can do to try to address those challenges. And Archie, I love what you said about students centered, uh, having a student-centered institution and what kinds of institutions are actually student-ready. Um, because I think a theme in so much of the work, and if you know a little bit about the history of, of higher ed, we designed a system for a student that is actually a minority of the students that we serve. We designed a system, um, and if you were blessed and able to be able to go directly after high school, go full time, rely on your parents for financial support, you may have had a job, but it was something that was minor, you were able to finish in four years and go on to another career, that's absolutely wonderful. But so many of the students that we are serving, and particularly low uh, income students, first generation students, many students of color, and think about our older adult students, many of whom are returning 
returning into the system because they realize that they really can't support themselves, their dependents, their families without some kind of additional uh, kind of training. And so when you think about the pipeline, first of all, realize that education is about getting a number of handoffs right. And whether that is preschool into kindergarten, into first grade, to middle school, and so on, uh, that's the same thing with, with higher education. And we're doing it at a time when there are so many different distractions, challenges, crises that are coming at our students. So we have to make sure, as institutions, we're able to help them make it through that pipeline. From the initial connection uh, with an institution, whatever that admissions process, when we educate them about what we have to offer and they're making choices um, about what are they going to study and hopefully it's going to lead to a, a credential of value, um, how much debt they're going to take, how are they going to balance this with all their other kinds of decisions, um, into entry, and oftentimes this is revolving around for so many of our students, majority of our students at community colleges, about 40% of our students at four-year institutions, and to remedial or developmental courses, so basically taking high school level courses at college level prices and already starting that Pell Grant <laughs> clock and, and other things. Um, and we have to get them through that initial, that initial um, entry point. And for a lot of our first generation students, you're in this new community where it's assumed you know how you're supposed to act. As a, as a student, um, where increasingly now there's been more press and, and one of our colleagues, uh, Tony Jack, um, has done a great deal of work in this area, but the fact that students don't even know what office hours are. Uh, how are they supposed to know how to access resources and to progressing into their, their choice of study and getting to completion? And there are so many pieces that wrap around this. Um, I, on the slide, mentioned just kind of four major areas of, of that we might have, um, that students face challenges where we might be able to make some progress in terms of solutions. And a little bit, this kind of shows um, how I approached it throughout my career. Um, obviously, the cost of higher education is very very high, the sticker shock, you compare this to, to what family incomes are. And so when I first entered this work, I thought a lot about affordability. That's got to be the problem. That must be why some people don't go to college. That must be why some people drop out. Um, and there's a great deal of work to say, yes, financial aid works very well. It is impactful, but it needs to be clear. Uh, it needs to be easy to access. Uh, we need to have policies that, policies that meet students where they are. And so some of my work has revolved around the FAFSA, which it's, it's interesting in many research presentations I've done, usually there's someone in the audience who just had to grapple with that form and pulled out their hair. Uh, and I'm sorry, even though the department used to say, you know, it'd only take you an hour to fill out, it's usually, I think I've only met maybe three people in my entire life who've actually met the hour mark. Um, so this gets to the point of forms. We've created all kinds of, of policies, not to say that the amount of financial aid that exists is sufficient, we don't have enough, but but in order to access the financial aid that is out there, you have to know about a bunch of processes and forms and deadlines. And if you look at a government form, it will be in very small font. It will have scary language saying, if you mess up, we'll, we'll send you to jail and charge you $250,000. And when you're talking with a lot of families, particularly low-income families, first-generation families, they don't realize that forms like the FAFSA are really just information gathering. They think that they're committing to something. Um, and so our processes in getting access to financial aid to try to help with the affordability problem actually end up being deterrents. And some of the work um, that I did suggested just helping students fill out financial aid forms actually increased college going by 28%. It was a, an intervention that we did in Ohio uh, and, and North Carolina, actually with some Gates funding, among others, uh, that just getting people over the barrier of the form and giving them access to financial aid is quite important. This also shows up once students are in school, they don't realize they have to fill out the form each and every year in order to continue getting financial aid. But what you see some institutions doing is now that they have uh, this, this role of students, they know to send out reminders, they know to give help, because nobody wants to leave money on the table, even if it's not quite enough to meet all the bills. 
So after doing a bunch of work on affordability and realizing, though, financial aid was not going to fix every problem, I thought, okay, well, what is something that we do know we are inheriting? The, the fact that our K-12 through system is not equal and that many of our students, particularly our low-income students, the populations that we worry about so much are coming from K-12 through systems that may not have the rigor or opportunity or supports and counseling to get to academically prepare them for higher education. And so I mentioned already uh, just briefly uh, remedial and developmental courses, and so spending some time, and this is actually where you see a tremendous amount of action in the last decade, where you see colleges and universities uh, owning the fact that um, as uh, a higher education system, part of what our responsibility is, if we want students to succeed, is helping to meet them where they are and prepare them for longer-term study. And so what we realize is a lot of programs that have been ignored are remedial programs on the side. We needed to rethink things like placement exams. You know, how many students didn't realize that they had to take a placement exam? They showed up and it was material that they hadn't seen for three years. So of course they're not going to do well on it, but then it has huge implications for whether or not they're actually doing post-secondary study and what the costs are. So lots of reforms in terms of academic supports, summer bridge programs, um, other kinds of supports along with college going work. So you see now a number of colleges saying maybe what the better thing to do is mainstreaming. We'll just put mm -hmm. students in the college level course, but we'll give them other supports, academic supports around that. Or how can we use technology to try to buttress uh, what students' skills, uh, what they might need? Which brings me to the third point, information. And a theme that I've already been touching upon is both the financial aid system and knowing how to prepare and how to go into post-secondary courses involves needing a great deal of information. Um, and if you think about it for a moment, many of us have been in, in higher ed for a while and we use inside baseball language and lots of acronyms and buzzwords. But if you go back and you think about what's it like when you are a 16-year-old or even a 12-year-old figuring, do I want to take this college prep curriculum? The process of getting, of preparing, getting into an institution and attending an institution, let alone getting out the other side, is not one that was designed with logic or common sense <laughs> in mind. Um, and usually here I would have a slide and tell you all the different steps and even taking the SAT is about five different steps because of all the things you have to do to register and show up and, and, and so forth. So there are all these really, really high stakes decisions that have to be made in the right order at the right time. And if you miss a deadline, then you're already off, off track. And has huge implications, again, for your progress, for your finances, uh, and so on. And so what you've seen is a big movement. You saw this certainly uh, within the government, but you see uh, both federal and state, but also institutions thinking about how much of a barrier lack of information, complex information, confusing information is. And this is also touches upon for our many students that are going into our community colleges, which are just a wealth of opportunity, but not every class is created the same. Not every class is going to count towards an associate degree or transfer to a four-year institution, but that's not always obvious uh, uh, to students. So have, helping them have the right information to make these really critical decisions and doing it from their point of view rather than what was convenient perhaps for the, for the administration or the way the government designed a policy. Which brings me to the last point, and that is supports. These are high stakes questions that have major repercussions, and students are trying to navigate through them as best they can, and they do need supports while they're going through these processes, um, whether it's making decisions about academics or finances or how to balance all of it. Um, and what we do see for students, given the long periods of time that, that college post-secondary training can be, is at some point, and we don't know if it's going to be day five hmm. or day 73, or day 217, they are going to need help. They are going to need someone they can go to who can help them deal with the crisis, whether that be the $300 car repair that they can't make and they can no longer get to, to, camp, to campus, or the part-time job that they have where their supervisor just changed their schedule so now they can no longer go to the class that they need, or the confusion about which class should I take, and where can I get additional academic supports. Their lives are complicated, um, and in order to be able to navigate them, they are going to need support. 
sorts. And so you have seen a big push on a number of institutions trying to make more of people available. There are a number of things that are kind of rote and routine that we can take those processes elsewhere, but there's a personalization and meeting the student where they are to help them navigate these, these issues um, where it becomes critical for supports. So this is just four categories of things. Of course, there are many others, and they absolutely um, mingle, co-mingle together. Um, but the great thing is there is a great deal of good work that is being done out there. And when institutions come together and their teams come together, it's great to be able to share those stories because oftentimes they don't quite rise, rise to the top. But as a community, somewhere, someplace in this country, someone has probably figured out the problem that you are grappling with. And we need to ha actually communicate with each other to try to support each other um, and so that we can all do better. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Jim. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Jim Honan, I'm a faculty member here at the Harvard Graduate School of Education, and over the past couple years, it has been my great good fortune to collaborate with Dean Long and Matt Miller on this exploration of what it means to lead for student success. I want to acknowledge uh, one of Archie's colleagues here, a proud graduate of our higher education <laughs> program, so Matt Krellen who now works at the Gates Foundation, has been an incredible thought partner to our team and two of our colleagues on our research team who might be watching on the stream. So Aaron Kenny and Kathleen Bennett, if you're there in Seattle, we appreciate all of your work as well. So um, Matt asked me to say a few words about one element of our project and both Archie alluded to it. You said, you know, where does, where does student success show up in resource allocation? And if you look at Bridget's slide where she just articulated some of the strategies that institutions uh, pursue to improve student success possibilities, my little piece of this puzzle was in what we called the strategic finance area, which is what I teach here. And I guess a couple observations, and some of our students are in the room here, you've heard this before, um, a, a big priority in an institution, and in this case student success, student success is not free. It's not resource neutral, and if you want to do more of it and get better at it, you have to really think more carefully about resources. And I guess in our project, we were calling that strategic finance. And this slide here was incredibly powerful to me as one who's been teaching this for quite some time, and I've talked to this with Archie and Matt and others in our team here is when we spent some time early on, and I know Karen Stout is here, also Juliet Garcia, helped us clarify some of the capacities. You know, we did leadership, strategic finance, and data. And when we got to the strategic finance uh, part, one of the recommendations in our research project says, this requires more thought. <laughs> and we were traveling all over the darn place. We were talking with lots of people. And it was so interesting to us as a research team. We said, you know what? That's, we don't have that quite right yet. And our colleagues at Gates were incredibly patient and thoughtful. So they actually assigned us a separate project to explore strategic finance in more depth. And Matt and his colleagues really sat with us and said, can you drill down even more on what you think this is and how strategic finance can support student success? So what resulted, and I think, I think we cooked this up in a high tower office building in Seattle once over lots of flip charts. I think we referred to this as the golden slide. That's the gold <laughs> color there. But here's the big idea, and I think it's incredibly important for both aspiring leaders but skilled leaders in higher education with a potentially a deeper or a more nuanced understanding of what does strategic finance look like in support of student success. And so what we came upon from our interviews and discussions with folks, the bottom part of that were some foundations. And we made a distinction between foundations and levers. And it took us a while to get there because we were spending lots of time on foundations and we realized they were necessary but not sufficient to move the needle on student success. And among other things in our task of the follow-up uh, project that I had the good fortune of working on, it had to be three or four hundred slide, uh, slides in a deck <laughs> that we were going to go through on some institutional examples in strategic <coughs> finance. And I had the good fortune of spending lots of time with all 300 of those slides. 
But what we came up with was this distinction of foundations and levers. And foundations, you can see from the slide here, obvious, important, and there are certain people in our organizations who spend lots of time on them in the finance area. So, for, for example, data-informed culture. Do we have finance data? Do we actually use it in resource allocation conversations around student success? Financial data infrastructure, and literally when we were in some places, they said, great questions, we can't generate those reports. <laughs> Interesting. Organizational structure, and especially in the finance area, so what we found is many of the finance folks we talked to weren't at the table around the student success conversations, and this was not pleasing to them and obvious to us as a potential gap. And then lastly, governance. And we earlier this morning had a panel in our IEM 50th, and Dick Chait talked some about the role of trustees. Mm -hmm. And governance decisions are implicit in financial decisions, and we saw a big disconnect in some of those things. So those are foundational. If we can't get that right, we can't get to the other parts. So then here was the golden slide finding. And what we did was in analyzing all of these cases, we literally did little checklists. As are these institutions who are showing some promise in student success utilizing some of these levers around strategic finance? And so left to right, the obvious ones are resource allocation and resource reallocation, which is to say if you don't move the money around, the results will chances are stay much the same. So we were in search of examples not just doing a good job in the budget process, but actually changing how you thought about allocating resources. The second part, and literally you know this from our teaching too, is making the resource pie bigger. And we had some panels earlier today, Karen Stout and John Wilson, talking about community colleges and historically black colleges and universities. If you need to make the resource pie bigger, you need to pull on the lever of resource generation. And a lot of our campus visits talked about that challenge to say, without those resources, we can't do it. We say this a lot, student success can't be an unfunded mandate. Student success can't be an underfunded aspiration. And if we can't make the pie bigger, chances are we won't develop the capacity to do some of the things both Archie and Bridget talked about. And then last but not least, in our analysis of these cases and the third element, a very powerful lever, financial planning and analysis. Another way to think about this is multi-year strategic financial planning linked to some other uh, exercises. And Archie and I were just talking before here, this is where the rubber hit the road. The little frequency count in our analysis of the cases, very few institutions got that far to start pulling on that lever. Sadly, this is where the sustainable, sort of high-impact, multi-year work around student success occurs. And our puzzle in these cases is when you got to those slides, there were lots of blank spaces. There weren't a lot of check marks to say to what extent is the institution engaging in some of these more strategic financial analysis levers. So the big idea here, and for those of you based at institutions, we need the stuff in the lower boxes because we can't pull on the levers without them. On the other hand, pulling on the golden box levers there, if you will, requires leadership in a big way. Last word, Matt Miller asked me to talk about what else we found out about strategic finance, about the fact that many finance folks didn't feel that they were at the table. So one of our other recommendations in our research project to our colleagues was, you know what, there should be a program for cross-functional teams to come together to look at student success, to connect the dots among leadership, strategic finance, uh, strategic uh, or data use, and then think about some practices that work. And we sort of looked around and said, that sounds like a good idea. Who would do that? <laughs> and our dean, Bridget Terry Long, said, we should do that at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. So this past summer, we launched our newest program, a cross-functional team-based program uh, looking at leadership, strategic finance, and data in student success. It's called Leading for Student Success. And this summer, we will offer the second version of what may be many versions of that particular program. Jokingly, in an interview, I said the, the other day, we will look forward to celebrating the 50th anniversary of that program some 49 years from now. So, <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks. All right. Thanks, thanks the three of you, for, uh, for putting a lot of ideas on the table. Okay, so I, for one, would like um, some hope. As the one who started <laughs> with statistics about how... Um, 
uh, in peril the public perception of higher education is. I wonder if we could just kind of go down and give each of you an opportunity to just share what's working out there concretely. What are some of the kinds of ways in which institutions are making progress that you think should give us hope that we can move the needle on student success? I'll start with Bridget. Great, thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so even when I finish my earlier comments, I like to try to end on a high note that there is promise and optimism and, and things that are going on. Um, what I would say in general, and I see a number of institutions doing this, is as more data have become available and as we realize that we are all complex institutions in our own context with our own students, you do see institutions taking seriously the question, what problem are we solving? And so looking at your own data to try to understand which population, subpopulations are struggling and which courses, where are they kind of uh, leaking out of, out of the pipeline? And so you've seen much more, if we can't do everything, if we need to be strategic, do we need to focus on our gateway courses? Do we need to focus on our counseling or advising? Do we need to focus on our remedial or dev ed courses? What uh, do we need to focus on transportation, bus passes, child care, parking? You know, really, uh, you see a lot more institutions pausing for a moment, questioning assumptions, looking at data, having focus groups, and then one by one addressing the problems and listening to their, what their students are saying uh, that they need to have done. And I think that. Uh, very much has, has been a shift of let me look inside. It's not going to be one size fits all, but small things can make a huge difference. And so I think that gives me a lot of optimism. And as you start to share these stories, hopefully for those of you from institutions, you go home thinking, wow, there are things we can do. And not everything has to be major and yes, we do need more resources, um, but sometimes a shift in thinking and working together in teams, you can actually bring about uh, progress. Hmm. Archie, what do you think? What's, what's there to be hopeful so, about out there? I'm very hopeful that we have more adults changing their behavior. <laughs> I'm, 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 we're, we have kind of a hypothesis about adult be, the changes in adult behavior and what really counts. At the end of the day, as we know, higher education institutions were not built to work in teams. And so you almost have to force it to have, so some, something needs to happen from the outside, an external policy development, for example, changes in developmental education policy in Florida, or on the inside when you realize, oh wait, we actually are gonna, we're gonna be uh, facing a catastrophic change to our student uh, enrollment unless we do something. And that when you force people to work together beyond their traditional silos. So imagine a picture where your chief financial officer works very closely with your chief academic officer, works very closely with your chief student success officer, institutional research officer, so that they're all essentially playing from uh, the same book, then at the very least, you get them to start growing in the same direction. Obviously, that doesn't take away the strategic, you know, the, the finance uh, officer's roles and responsibilities on finance, but how might I, allocate or reallocate my sources, resources knowing that at some point we will need to invest in a large, let's say, advising system. Working with your HR person, knowing in advance that, oh wait, we'll, we're gonna have to think about, uh, about staffing and, and, and staff allocation. So we're seeing more institutions doing that as a result of these external or internal pressures, and, and that's at the foundation. We're trying to get more institutions to do that, and so we want to help identify tools, methods, and resources so that institutions can do that. Great. Jim. So two things give me hope. So as part of this project, actually, Archie and I were on a panel together at the Association for Institutional Research, and he was still in his Miami Dade role, and that's the first time I got to meet him in person. And you gave me hope. Oh, good. So <laughs> he talked to this room full of about, bigger than this, several hundred institutional research directors. And in an earlier part of my life, I was institutional research coordinator here at Harvard. And I wish I could be as good as he is in what he does. He told that group that what gives him hope in his work is working in teams and exercising leadership. So he was actually pushing on these institutional research folks in this room, several hundred, to say, 
exercise your leadership in this work, and this gets to this team piece. So that's one idea that gives me a lot of hope, and there was a lot of good reaction like, okay, when I go back to my campus, I won't see this institutional research function in more of a silo. You can lead in that way. Something else gives me hope, and as part of this project, Matt Krellen and others sent us to institutions that were actually showing some promising success around student outcomes, around equitable student outcomes, and they asked us to say, go talk to those folks and see what's working. Okay. And a very specific example in strategic finance that gave me a lot of hope, I pose it just the way Matt just did. So give us an example of something that's working in strategic finance that you're seeing good positive results around student success. And the example was reallocation. There was a team of people around the table. I posed the question in just that way. And I said, do you have an example of what this looks like in practice? They said, absolutely. They said, last year, we looked at our student success data, student outcomes data, and we spotted some issues that we needed to improve on. We then called in our budget and finance folks and said, in the next budget cycle, unless we make some changes, those results won't improve. And the example was they reallocated money from academic affairs to student success, literally some academic departments and faculty lines, if you can believe it, toward other issues that were showing promise based on what Bridget just talked about to say, we'll move the needle if we can allocate resources there. It was not easy. There was an internal governance, as you might imagine, to a conversation and a budget decision was made. But post that decision, they said, and we really grappled with that dilemma and we actually did it. So in my view, it's possible. Is it easy? No. Uh, but as Archie talked about, some of the things that are getting in our way might be ourselves and then say if we can bring people together. So on that resource reallocation side, I'm quite impressed. <coughs> And so, Jim, you mentioned Archie's experience at uh, Miami-Dade College, which is the largest community college in the United States, largest producer of degrees for Latinx, African-American students, um, a really important kind of testing ground as well, too. And I wonder, Archie, since you have this um, unique position of not only have you worked at other higher education institutions, you're now inside a foundation which is really driving a lot of the work across the country in supporting student success efforts. But what did you learn at Miami-Dade? Hmm. Because I feel like this was actually an early conversation when we knew you at Miami-Dade College. You know, we're, we're calling up Archie saying like, <laughs> Everyone is talking about the things that Miami-Dade is doing and the kinds of practices that, um, that Archie had a role in putting in place. And so if you could just share some of those concrete things sure, that you yeah. did and lessons you learned there at Miami-Dade. So, uh, th thank you for, for that, Jim. I, th that, was, that was very nice. I, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I saw an opportunity. So I, I, as Vice Provost for Institutional Effectiveness, I oversaw institutional research, assessment, evaluation, and testing, planning and policy analysis, and accreditation for the institution. I knew that institutional research and data were critical um, because we could operate the same way we've been operating without interrogating what the data were telling us, where the gaps were. Um, and once we started digging a little bit more deeply into the data to actually identify what problems we were trying to solve, the tough part was I had to raise my hand, and sometimes I have to raise my hand not in my, I, I told my bosses at the foundation, look, just so you know what you're getting, I don't <laughs> usually stay in my lane, I apologize. <laughs> but if I see something, I say something, right? And so that's the same thing I did, is we started doing analysis. We were still doing, uh, in, in institutional research, we were still doing the compliance reporting, because that's required. But in addition to that, or we use that vehicle to start disaggregating data. So in the data community, you're going to, in the IR community, disaggregating data is kind of the next new thing because we want to actually get deeper using student level data. We started discovering some things, some patterns. Um, we started looking at pass rates by certain student characteristics about what courses they took prior to that, uh, that course, what grade they got prior to that course. So we started lifting some of these things and without even and, and this is kind of the, the, the raising my hand part, those folks didn't ask for the data. We just, I just showed up and invited myself to meetings um, to share some of these data. A great case in point. We discovered that there was a link between the grades that students got in their gateway math course 
to their performance in their chemistry course in a particular program. Right? You would think, obviously, if you're looking at 30,000 foot view, that makes a lot of sense. Right? But our faculty and chairs in those programs hadn't actually even talked to each other about what the success rate looks like. And so all we did was show the data. And then we invited them to have a conversation. Obviously, that curriculum it's, is their arena, just to show what, what the differences were. If you change curriculum, if you align it a little bit better, this might be the case. This actually um, allowed us to expand a little bit of this work at Miami-Dade College. Our sister institution, our transfer four-year institution was Florida International University, FIU. We did the same thing. And so we started a data partnership with FIU where they, they, they told us, your students are doing this well or not well mm -hmm. based on the courses that they took at Miami-Dade and the grade that they got. Hmm. And that allowed, us to, that allowed our faculty to work with their faculty to then align the cur curriculum a little bit better. Hmm. But I wonder if any of you, and, and feel free to take it, any of you who wants to weigh in, because um, you mentioned faculty, Archie, and I think one of, the, one of the criticisms that I hear about discussion about student success is that a lot of the movement is really focused on things that are not about directly improving instruction. And so um, people like Karen Stout of Achieving the Dream have pointed to the critical importance of teaching and learning and student success efforts. And I just wonder if anybody just wants to comment on the role of the faculty in all of this that, um, as I said, sometimes uh, may be left out of talking about program solutions and, and big things that are working. Anyone want to take that? Sure, I'll, I'll jump in. Yeah, I think when you look at kind of the history of this work, so much of it started with other offices or outside of the classroom, but that's really been shifting. So first, I think acknowledging the fact that faculty at you know many of the kinds of institutions we're talking about, they didn't end there by accident. They're there because they're also mission focused, because they do care about the students, because they do want, want to do more. Um, I think what we're starting to see is a turn to what can be changed inside the classroom. And I think this is an example where it isn't necessarily more money, but it is how we do things. Before I said, uh, I gave the example of office hours and realizing taking a moment and talking about what office hours are, giving examples and inviting students in um, to that time, how you start the class, what you acknowledge, what examples you use, it's kind of costless, but it can send very different messages to students. Um, there also have been some wonderful experiments. Um, some uh, friends at, at UC Davis did a wonderful uh, intervention uh, at Sacramento State, which just involved sending e emails to students after the midterm saying, you did this well, congratulations, you're on, uh, you're, you are, look like you're going to do well in the class, um, but you're welcome to come see me. If the student didn't do well, then it connected them and said, there are all these different resources, I believe that you can do better. And just email messages, which are basically free, had uh, a meaningful impact on the percentage of students who, who passed the class, uh, the percentage of students who actually reported satisfaction, the amount of time they spent on homework. So those kinds of things, how faculty conduct their classes, how they teach, how they engage, really does make a difference. And I do think a lot of the, the reform that's been going on in developmental education is really quite exciting because that is very much inside the classroom. And it's taken helping faculty to understand with data, you know, who are the students, where, and meeting them where they are, what do we know about trying to help students make progress and actually prioritizing what are the key learning goals that you need to have in math or reading or writing to be successful. And the data actually gives us some sense, sense about that, about what to prioritize. So that's where you've seen a lot of discussion. You see faculty coming together talking about learning goals, mm -hmm. talking about content, talking about pedagogy, and realizing they're dealing with a student population where maybe they didn't get it the first time in high school. So we have to think more creatively about how we are going to help them learn. So Matt, in our research conversations, there was a slide where we had about um, what's the job in student success, and I think you put it up there. It said it's to reduce barriers that students are facing in their experience. 
And that may sound obvious, but then as we went to various institutions, we talked about that, and it goes to your point, Archie, is there some shared understanding among faculty and staff members that the job of student success is to reduce barriers that students are facing in their experience at your institution? And these could be large or small. And so one, Archie gave the example of the forms. We had some examples was when the, the your payment for student work or something was submitted or not and got in the way. Others, what if the faculty members are doing things that are actually causing barriers and not helping students reduce them? The one that comes to my mind very powerful was the one of our visits was reducing or, or, or removing advisor holes mm. in a timely fashion. <laughs> so for faculty members who are doing whatever I think they're ed, doing. Ed school students can relate to that. Is, <laughs> is that but these notions of yeah. awareness of the mm -hmm. faculty role in a more holistic way that in some cases some of the smaller issues yeah. could actually have an impact on student success. Uh, uh, central, the role of the faculty in all of this is central. Uh, the foundation recently launched a commission to look at the value of post-secondary education to try to put some, some markers on the ground of how, how might you define it, how might you measure it. Um, and even in my days um, at the department, we could produce credentials all day long, but at the end, the end of the day, if those are not high quality credentials, um, they will have been meaningless. And so we see the faculty as having a very, very central role in that. A quick plug though, we know that in addition to involving and helping the faculty uh, do their work better, that the, the, the notion of professional development for faculty also needs to be refreshed a little bit yeah. and what that looks like. Um, and so I think that's worth exploring. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay, mindful of the fact that uh, we want to leave time for questions from the audience, I want to just give you one last very action-oriented question and give you each a chance to, to weigh in on it. Okay, so what's the sort of advice you provide to leaders? Whether they are in institutions where they are earlier in the journey of transformation of the institution, if you're trying to be a place, as Jim was describing, where Broadly speaking, people are good at reducing barriers for students and removing obstacles uh, for students. Where do people start? What's, what's the advice for leaders? Um, can I start down on that end with you, Jim? Sure. So at the end of our Leading for Student Success program, and Karen Stout was with us there, each of the leadership teams came up with an action plan. And as we walked around the room, you make the point, institutions and their leaders are in different places here. Mm -hmm. um, to some institutions, we were saying, just start. <laughs> is you're going to have to say, student, you know, raise your hand. Student success is really important at our institution, and I want to go on record and say that. Something along those lines. Secondly, I think the advice is understanding the stakeholders mm -hmm. in this and having conversations. This may sound obvious, but a lot of our conversations, there wasn't shared agreement on a mm -hmm. campus on what constituted student mm -hmm. success. So you can't sort of run down some strategies without that part there. And then some pilots and experiments, not starting with a grand strategy, but to say, can we show some promise with some innovations around student success? So our teams this summer left hoping to do some things to get some of those things moving. That would be my advice to mm -hmm. leaders. Archie. My advice, and I, I, would, I would couch this by saying I view leaders as everybody in, in the organization because everybody has a role to play. If, if you can't see how your role connects to student success, there's an issue there. Um, and so part of the empower, empowering things that I did uh, at Miami Dade College was talked with my junior analysts, for example, and said, you are as much part <coughs> about, about, of the student success agenda as I am, and you are an in your sphere of influence, you have an opportunity to do your job really well, so that we're all successful, but number two, to orient your job into a student success framework, right? So even if your job is looking at classroom utilization rates, that's actually super critical in, in student success, right? So it's not just producing the reports, but actually taking the next step of then lifting it up so that somebody can, can take it and use it to improve student success. Uh, I completely agree with what Jim and, and Archie said, and they took some of my answers. Um, uh, but I would say I would say two things. I think one, as the leader of the organization, uh, I mean, we may think that student success. It's obvious we should be focused on student success, but it isn't always so obvious. And, and sometimes I think people do have trouble connecting the dots. So an important 
part of being leader is is communicating, is defining that narrative, is helping to articulate that narrative so that other people can also repeat it and believe it. Um, and so for your particular institution, your particular context, really thinking deeply about how all of our success is tied to our students' success, our sustainability, our contributions, our mission. Uh, and that might, that message might be a little bit different depending on the institution, so I think you have to look within. Um, the second thing is I would start with an asset-based approach. There are many, many challenges our students face, but there are also many, many things that they're bringing to the table. Um, and it's not inspiring to start with problem, 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 <clears throat> instead of thinking about what can we build from, uh, what are the motivation, the hard work, the dedication, as well as the assets that the staff and the faculty already have, the tinkering they've already been doing um, along the edges that maybe they're not getting recognized for. The, you know, the, the small game, you know, not the senior leaders, but you know, down at the student level, looking for those examples to elevate and say, let's build upon, build upon those um, as we try to create a vision for the entire institution. Okay, helpful advice. I want to now invite you, if you're thinking about uh, asking a question, we have two microphones, one in each aisle. Feel free to just stand on up and line up at either of those two microphones, and I'll recognize you. Let me just say, um, as we uh, take about 15 minutes for um, this period of questions, um, to, if you're asking a question, to make sure it's actually a question, that it's, <laughs> that it's, one, that it's one question, and that it ends with a question mark. <laughs> Richard. Uh, uh, Richard Blackburn, Mississippi State University. Uh, I don't know if this is a question, Matt, but uh, it's something <laughs> that I'd like a comment on. Yeah. There are a lot of great ideas that you've shared and a lot of thought-provoking things for us as practitioners. What I didn't hear a lot about, it's pretty well documented that our students are coming to us today with more emotional mm -hmm. issues than they have ever had. Mm -hmm. I personally have faculty that are struggling with how to work with these students. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I would just want to know if uh, any or all of you would like to comment on that because it exacerbates the very issues of student success. Yeah, great, yeah. great question. Who wants to take that? I want to acknowledge that what you're saying is absolutely right. Mental health and wellness, I'm not sure if it's growing or if we're just acknowledging it more mm -hmm. and understanding that it's intertwined with academic, with financial, with all kinds of other stresses that students are confronting. It's, you know, when a student leaves, it's rarely just one thing. It's not just money. It's, mm -hmm. it's a combination of things. Um, and so the investments that we need to make in terms of wellness, actually not only for our students, but also for our faculty and staff, mm -hmm. and creating a culture of support and help seeking, I think it is very important. But that does become something else that we have to invest in. But it's absolutely necessary and dire for, for us for us to do that? At the institutions where we see uh, the student success agenda thriving, there's this notion that the institutional community is family. This comes up often when we do our interviews with those institutions. So in, in trying to dig deeper about what that means, it means looking at everybody, faculty, staff, and students as a whole person. Right, and so some, uh, for some institutions, doing some holistic support is not uh, easy to do, and so it has to be an intentional decision that needs to be made. But completely agree with you that we can't, we can't slice off that part of students and expect them to be successful. You agreed. Multi student success has multifaceted. Yep. Where are the linkages? Where are the resources and connections? Bridget slide on. Where are the supports? Yep. I would add that to that. It's really important. Thank you. Yes, it was a very insightful discussion. Uh, I feel that uh, uh, you have touched on whatever is necessary, even though I don't think some of those things you said are going to really go all that not only you or other institutions are going to go all the way to it. The proof, uh, and I'm getting to a question, I would, have preferred, I would have also loved to see a student there mm. and a teacher mm -hmm. who is actually teaching you know, so that I can get more insight. So when you're talking about student-oriented, uh, student-ready colleges, and I would like to hear the voice of the student, and 
clearly you've touched on some of the issues talking about the story of the student that I love what the the, po the president of that community college said it's about helping students realizing their dream and also the fact that it is all about the teacher and the learning. So now there is the discourse and there have been discourses to our generation, there have been incremental progress, but in the reality what's happening? In the community college, it's a, it's a bunch of politics to get teachers. I have been a professional student, I know the system. It's a joke. Apart from the higher class or the Ivy League and the great school, People hire their friends who are not have PhDs. They come and joke, and you know, particularly in the psychosocial sciences, or people put up with just little in the exact sciences. And we all know what's going on in the colleges. If you if you're doing education and you're not doing research, you know, you must not be that good. Everybody knows that. Okay, so I understand at the graduate level you should be focused on research, even at the master's level. But at the under, at the undergrad level. Professors should be trained in, in, in teaching. So, in few words, I think the teacher is not just, as Paulo Freire said, you know, is not just someone, an activist, but now, as I heard somebody say here, it's an agenda facilitator. So, what about all these PhDs that are, that are graduating? What are they not hired to teach classes, not with one professor, but with four professors? Not four different classes, but one class with four different professors, investing in the professor and also investing in the student so that the professor can relate the story of the student, relate to the story of the student, and then refer the student to support instead of the support going. So all I'm asking, what about it being student-oriented and teacher-oriented first before we talk about all these other things, all these investment that are useful, all these stadiums and all these kind yes. of things happen. Okay, um, so teaching. Teaching. And faculty development. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I would say, first of all, we have 6,000 different institutions who are doing all kinds of things, and you see many, many more embracing the teaching function. They're not there to be research institutions. The bulk of our institutions are not research universities. They are actually teaching. That is their main objective, and they're attracting people because that's what they want to do. You also see incredible growth in thinking about P, P through 16 and beyond kinds of systems where we realize for some students it's only a couple months different between high school and college. So having teaching forces in high schools actually working with those who are in colleges because it is a continuation. Again, it is a pipeline. But I think one, uh, Archie mentioned this before, I think you've mentioned it, something that is incredibly important is investing in the professional development of the faculty. When you get a PhD, a research degree, you don't take, they don't teach you how to teach. Um, you see a number of schools, though, taking seriously that when they are inducting new instructors, whether they are full-time faculty, adjuncts, and with the growth of adjuncts on our faculty, schools have had to take this more seriously. How are they inducting new instructors into the institution of how they're teaching, how they're meeting students where they are, letting them know where the resources are so they can connect students who are struggling? That has become a, a growing part of what colleges have had to take very seriously because those initial courses decide so much of whether or not a student decides to stay and persist or not. Yeah, I mean, and one thing to think about simply, which we've heard from a number of campuses, is it's important to invest in making sure your faculty understand their community and their student body. Yeah. And that is something, that knowledge is scalable, mm -hmm. um, and there's no excuse for institutions not helping faculty as part of joining mm -hmm. a community and staying in a community to really understand what students are experiencing. Um, and I think you've, you've seen a lot of this in the ways that faculty have known who cared about what students were experiencing, things like the levels of food insecurity, housing insecurity, uh -huh. homelessness that students are experiencing. But now institutions are being more proactive. Um, the research community is being more proactive about measuring the prevalence yeah. Yeah. of these kinds of experiences and the effect they have on students. And, uh, so that the faculty really uh, understand the most important thing, which is who am I teaching? Right. Yeah. So, uh, over here. Thank you very much for your presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, just a question, seems a bit theoretical question. How can you, or how can meritocratic rules of some universities, such as Harvard, be compatible with the idea of equity that you are promoting? Mm. 
that's a deep question. <laughs> Who wants to take that one? <laughs> so not our team, not me. <laughs> <laughs> not you. you get off on this one. Um, just to kind of, I heard only part of it. So the question of how can Harvard uh, be involved in this and in work of equity and so forth. So. I feel some responsibility in taking that as, um, as the Ed School is hosting this. I think a, a really important part of our mission and what has attracted students, faculty, and staff here is taking seriously that our responsibility, our contribution to the world is to attack really big problems and challenges and try to provide uh, solutions and partnership and communication with others. To also be a convener, to bring together people to talk about these kinds of issues. Not that we have the answer to every question, um, but to bring people together to really focus on these really challenging issues. That is, that is our responsibility. As the Ed School, we are very much an outward facing, impact focused. That is what our, our purpose and our whole existence um, for being is is that here. But if we can bring together people, whether they are degree students or in professional education or just happen to be walking down the street and want to pop in in a Nasquith forum to join the conversation, the only thing you need for entry is that like-mindedness that you want to address those challenges. So, uh, Matt, you started out the session by, by citing some of the, 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 the Pew and the Gallup surveys that uh, that where there, there's some disturbing trends in losing the public trust and, and questions being asked about the value of the credentials that we provide. So as, as we've gotten better at working on student success, and even when institutions have made some pretty dramatic improvements, that certainly helped us with policymakers in our states. But it doesn't seem to be doing much for us in terms of the broader public trust. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so, so here, here's a question. So, how do we, how do we take some of this energy and channel it in ways where it it could feel accessible and relevant to a broader public? Great question. And I think he directed Jim. it at you. Oh, <laughs> I have my own. Well, one, you know, one of the I just uh, I just came back from spending some time with a wonderful group of California community college presidents, and for those of you who've been following the news in California, um, you know they've had a major change to their funding mechanism for higher education called the student-centered funding formula, uh, that creates a number of incentives that are aligned with um, with student success goals. However, within the community colleges, it's still very controversial. Mm -hmm. And part of that is that, um, you know, we have promising steps at the state level, let's say in the policy environments where uh, funding that most touches the lives of community college students, faculty, uh, and leaders. Um, but we also still have mismatches. Um, and those include um, the fact that even with a broad agreement by the uh, political forces in Sacramento and California. Um, still really challenging at the level of individual colleges to deliver on the promise. So if you are living in a relatively remote part of the central California coast, and the nearest Cal State University to you is the vaunted uh, Cal Poly, San Luis Obispo, which has a vanishingly small acceptance rate, mm -hmm. um, you actually don't have a nearby transfer institution. Even though your college is being held responsible in the funding formula for how much it transfers students to, to institutions like the CSUs. And so imagine yourself as a leader in this situation. But you get the situation then of students and families. They're saying, wow, you know, they made a big, they made a big deal about, uh, you know, providing funding for community colleges, but I still can't go to a four-year institution, even though I do, I'm doing all the right things. So, you know, I find that some of those things, I think, will, will work themselves out. And I want to say that I think it's promising to be, you know, engaging with funding mechanisms and tools of policy that have that broad, that broad impact. But those, those are ways that students and families still feel very much um, the pinch that the system is not aligned um, always with their needs. But let me let others sort of weigh in on, 
on policy and how we how we work on the public trust together. It's a really good question. And so I was struck in some of our campus visits and some of the materials we got. First off, student success showing up as a strategic priority mm -hmm. in an institutional plan, the institutional signaling. We're serious about this. We're going to do some work. Your puzzle is, say, what sense do various stakeholders make of the narrative, mm. especially if you're getting some traction and making some progress? For me, that's a messaging issue of that's really true. thinking carefully about who is expecting what of our institutions and are we communicating that part of the narrative if, in fact, we're doing some of that. And there are gaps in that. I see this polling data as well, the lack of trust in the institution or saying, here's what I was expecting and that didn't happen. So for me, some of it's getting some of the narrative to these other stakeholders. I think a lot of what we're seeing are some colleges and universities still see each other in competition with each other, that they are essentially their, their storytelling is basically a, a, a giant view book for themselves, right? And so we need to get better at telling our story as an industry together. Completely side example, when Amazon was thinking about moving to Miami, the, uh, the institutions in Southern Florida got together and actually created a narrative about the higher education landscape in South Florida. And I was like, that's actually amazing because then you as a region got together, regardless of the type of institution, said, this is the capital that we have and this is, th this is how we're educating our workforce here. And I thought that was very powerful. Okay, we'll take another One more question. Yes. Hi, my uh, question is I, I'd love to know from the four of you with such expertise, what do you think funding or spending per student um, <laughs> required to achieve these goals is. Um, my, my, the, the Century Foundation, as you know, just did a report saying that the average funding per student at community colleges for the students you're talking about is about $14,000 per student, including heat and lights. Mm -hmm. um, here in Boston at Bunker Hill, where I've worked, it's 9000 per student. Um, at UMass Amherst, it's like 25000 per student. And, and at Williams <laughs> College, where I went, or here at Harvard College, it's about 50000 per student for instruction alone, not including the heat and lights. And is 9 to 14 enough? <laughs> and what, what should the number be? Because I, that's, when you talk about the emotional issues, such as my colleague said, these are, these are needy students. And, how, how can we win with so little funding? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I'm going to let the economist <laughs> on the panel respond to that question. Yes. I cannot tell you what the ideal is, but I can tell you that we're very far from it. Uh, I can also say, keeping in mind that equality is not what we're going for. We're going for equity. And so part of the, the major problem is uh, the students who need the most in terms of resources and supports to help them navigate complicated lives and, and, and challenges are receiving the least. So it's not just that Bunker Hill should be closer to Harvard, it should probably be above what Harvard is, which just exacerbates our frustration. <laughs> no, I, I mean, actually I've looked at this a great deal and I've looked at all the finance data and I don't think you want a long uh, a lecture on that, but it, it, it is going to say it's going to depend because it depends on what's their field of study, what are they uh, trying to accomplish, what are their goals, and so forth. What what uh, ways do we need to help them be the best student that they can be? Um, removing barriers or removing other kinds of, of challenges that they might be facing. I can't give you I can't give you a number, and even if I did, it would change tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> okay, can we thank our three panelists here? Thanks to all of you. Thank you. Thanks for the nice work. Wishing you a good holiday weekend. Thanks for joining oh us. Thank you.